Thanks for coming today, everyone. Um, I, I appreciate it. Looks like we have a quite a full house today. I'm going to be discussing unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia in late preterm and term infants. Um, and to begin, I would like to thank my supervisor, uh, Dr. Marsha Edmonds, as well as co-supervisors, co Tim Lynch and uh, Krista Hellman. So to begin, I don't have any disclosures, um, neither financial or conflicts of interest uh, regarding this topic or really any other. And today I'll be going over the history of neonatal jaundice, epidemiology, and some causational factors. I will briefly be describing anatomy and physiology as well as some pathophys before discussing how these inferences present. We will discuss universal screening initiatives and what needs to be done in the emergency department uh, and beyond when one of these infants presents uh, before touching on how these kiddos really make out. Now throughout the presentation, I'll be referring back to two cases to highlight some of the salient points. The first case uh, is a three-day-old infant sent in by a midwife, it's a little girl, um, for concerns of query jaundice. The infant's uh, three days old with the vitals are on screen there. Let's get to one of the juniors. Um, what would you want to know? Let's go Steph Chilton. Um, hopefully you can hear me all right. Um, yeah. So basically what I want to know is obstetrical history for the baby. Um, mm -hmm. How far along they were when they were born, any complications during pregnancy. Um, vaginal delivery or c-section and then their like course in hospital um, and basically since they went home um, I want to know any family history of jaundice um, and then and basically how they've been doing since are they breastfed or formula fed what's their hydration like um, that's great any vomiting fevers that kind of stuff perfect so mom reports that the baby is um, breastfeeding, waking every four hours to feed. It's a bit slow as for her. Uh, baby was born at 39 weeks and six days. The weight at birth was 2,850 grams and she was discharged at 24 hours of age. The weight currently is uh, 2,625 grams, so has lost a bit of weight. The pregnancy was otherwise unremarkable and mom had all of the prenatal screening tests done. Baby was born through a simple vaginal delivery with no complications and no devices utilized. APGARs were nine and nine. Um, baby's of Asian background, uh, but mom says that she was also jaundiced as a baby. There's no other apparent risk factors. Can anyone tell me how much weight is uh, too much weight to lose? Let's go John McIsaac. Hold on, can you hear me there? Yep. Um, how much weight over how long? Sorry, I missed the first part of that. No worries. How much weight uh, is too much weight for a newborn to lose? Uh, I think it's 10% um, of their birth weight. Yeah, great. And John, what uh, would you want to look for on exam for this baby? Um, on exam, I'd want to take a look, make, look for any sort of signs of uh, fluid depletion, uh, take a look at the fontanelles, make sure that um, the baby is um, moving all four limbs, look for any signs of jaundice, uh, like in the eyes and the skin, um, in the uh, oral mucosa. Um, yeah, and that's great. So exactly, looking for signs of uh, lethargy, clinical dehydration, uh, a good neuro exam with good tone and good reflex assessments. Um, and then this is what you see on, uh, on, on the baby. So definitely some jaundice. Um, what tests would you want to order? Let's go with Taylor. So I'd get uh, basic labs, extended lights, uh, a direct and indirect billy, uh, a DAT. Um, Perfect. What about tr the transcutaneous billy measurement for this infant? 
we have that available to us? Potentially, not really in our department, but it is a, a possibility. The second case I'm going to discuss is a, a bit different. Um, it's a newborn female also sent in by midwife for evaluation of jaundice at 14 hours of life. Vitals are presented on the screen. Now this baby was born at 40 weeks and four days uh, gestational age, also born by simple vaginal delivery. Mom was induced um, due to post states. APGARS for this infant was nine and nine. Now there was a prolonged rupture of membranes, but mom didn't require any antibiotics and there was really no other concerns around the pregnancy or delivery. All screening tests were completed and good. Mom actually brought in her maternal screening documents and, uh, and her blood type was um, RH positive. There is a, a discharge note from the midwife that describes uh, a Mongolian spot and a tuft of hair noted at the base of spine with no sacral dimpling and discusses that the baby uh, fed well almost immediately after birth. Now mom and baby were discharged home less than 24 hours after delivery and actually because of COVID mom was actually discharged within three hours post delivery. Uh, the midwife saw the baby within 24 hours as per guidelines and did arrange for some follow-up um, for this patient, specifically a newborn screen and hearing test. So this is actually a case I saw in the emergency department, and this is what I walked into. Now, my first thoughts immediately were this. Does anyone have anything that they would ask on history? Let's go Sydney. Yeah, sorry, I think I got it working. Um, yep, I can hear you. Perfect. So um, I would um, ask as far as, um, again, prior history for um, like any other uh, babies or family history with uh, related uh, issues, whether um, as far as the concern with the, um, the parent and uh, stuff like whether there was appropriate prenatal vitamin supplementation kind of thing. Yeah, perfect. So kind of moving back into the topic, um, this uh, topic is actually quite extensive and is really dependent on uh, many factors, including gestational age, the type of bilirubinemia and age at presentation. Uh, firstly, most evaluations of total serum bili in the first week of life um, are, uh, are actually due to increased bilirubin production or decreased clearance. And this results primarily in an unconjugated form of hyperbilirubinemia and is rarely associated with things like cholestasis. Those primarily uh, present with un or, uh, conjugated bilirubin. So I'm actually going to be focusing on the unconjugated form and those infants who are born over 35 weeks um, termed late preterm or at term uh, neonates. Um, I'm not going to be discussing anyone who's more uh, premature um, or those who are treated right at an, an initial hospitalization. I will say that conjugated hyperbilirubinemia um, is defined as a, a conjugated level uh, greater than 17 or when both conjugated and total are elevated greater than 20% of the total bili. Um, con conjugated hyperbilirubinemia is never physiologic and is never normal and needs further assessment. A bit of background, uh, neonatal jaundice was originally um, observed for centuries. Uh, in fact, the majority of neonates uh, will develop some degree of hyperbilly uh, with up to two thirds being clinically visible uh, within the first week of life. In 1724, Johann Jonker in the Conspectus Medicinae Theoretico Practicae discussed the difference between true jaundice, uh, which was a more serious uh, form and could result in significant morbidity and mortality, and what he described as the icteric tinge, uh, which may be observed in infants immediately after birth. This work was then later expanded by Jean-Baptiste Bombs in 1785 and Jacques Carveau in 1847, who both described significant, uh, a significant number of the pathoanatomical findings associated with jaundice and its progression. In 1875, Johann Orth published the first results of an autopsy demonstrating this intense yellow staining at the basal ganglia, third ventricle, hippocampus, and the center of the cerebellum. <clears throat> 
This was later termed kernicterus by Schmoll in 1903 after autopsying neonates who died of jaundice. Now, while studying treatments for erythroblastis fatalis, Dr. Lewis K. Diamond developed exchange transfusion and actually published it in 1951. In 58, however, a nurse in Great Britain uh, noticed that jaundice started to fade away after uh, babies were exposed to sunlight. Now jaundice, the clinically observable signs of hyperbilly, uh, for most neonates are not really concerning, but it's the progression of hyperbilirubinemia beyond certain concentrations that results in the potential for kernicterus and subsequently causing profound long-term sequelae and, and other neurologic injuries. Now this link was first identified in the mid-1950s um, in relation to rhesus hemolytic disease and as those with acute encephalopathy developed chronic neurologic changes. Two advances in medical care in the late 60s actually impacted in which uh, it, it how we treated this. Uh, first, it includes the use of Rogam or RH immunoglobulin to RH negative mothers, which dramatically decreased the incidence of the RH isoimmune neonatal hemolytic disease or hemolytic disease of the newborn. And secondly, the induction of phototherapy. This significantly reduced the need for exchange transfusion and then the risk of developing severe hyperbilly. Hyperbilly was originally treated quite aggressively throughout the 50s to 70s because of the high rate of uh, RH hemolytic disease and kernicterus. However, over the next couple of decades, pediatricians kind of lightened how they were treating uh, things, thinking that maybe they were a bit too aggressive. This subsequently led to dis uh, discharging newborns earlier from nurseries before the bilirubin concentrations had peaked. And these factors actually lead to it, led to an increase in kernicterus throughout the 1990s. Now, these are several definitions as supported by uh, the Canadian Pediatric Society. However, it's important to note that there's actually no true consensus between, between any of the major pediatric organizations on definitions, specific cutoff values, or actual intervention curves. The large majority of data are from longitudinal and observational studies, as well as databases. These make conclusions and guidelines a bit difficult to be solely evidence-based. As a result, the Canadian Pediatric Society, or CPS, uh, their guidelines and recommendations actually differ from those of our neighbors to the south, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and both are much less algorithmically described than the, our neighbors across the pond in the UK with the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. Although I did examine all three in depth, I'm primarily going to be focusing on the Canadian guidelines as that's where we live. And uh, I will point out some of the subtle differences between the three as we go on. Now, almost all term infants and preterm infants will develop a total serum uh, value greater than normal. Now, neonatal jaundice doesn't become clinically evident, evident until the serum levels rise above 70 to 100 micromoles per liter. Neonates with severe hyperbilly are at risk for developing acute bilirubin encephalopathy, and once the level is over 500, the risk of chronic encephalopathy or kernicterus is a concern. These constellation of neurologic symptoms along that trajectory are termed bilirubin-induced neurologic dysfunction by the American group. However, this has not really been taken up by the Canadians. It's important to note that the acute encephalopathy does not usually occur in full-term infants whose levels are below the severe concentrations, and it is very rare unless peak concentrations actually exceed a critical threshold. More than three quarters of infants in the U.S.'s kernicterus registry between 92 and 2002 had concentrations over 515 micromoles, but not everyone who was getting these levels actually ever became encephalopathic. Therefore, acute bilirubin encephalopathy is the primary concern for hyperbilirubinemia, although it's possible that some degree of neurotoxicity does occur at lower concentrations. These are unlikely to cause any significant encephalopathy at the time of presentation, but it could lead to some lower IQ or neurologic sequelae down the road. This is a, a table of risk factors identified by the CPS. Now, according to uh, CPS, these are important uh, uh, for severe hyperbilly. However, these risk factors are all quite common and the attributable risk of each of them is therefore quite low. 
They are of limited use in directing surveillance, investigation, or therapy by themselves, but when used in combination with a, a time serumbility analysis, it can be quite effective. There's also been no causational link ever established um, in the development of ser severe hyperbilly with any of these uh, factors, and these are all a result of retrospective observational studies. Now, in comparison to the Canadian group, um, the Americans uh, have a much more detailed as well as a broader list of, recommend or of risk factors. They specify East Asian specifically as denoted by the blue star, and compared, uh, or as compared to the Canadian, Asian, and European lists. They also split gestational age to 35 to 36 weeks as a major risk factor, and 37 to 38 weeks as a minor one, whereas uh, the Canadians just use under 38 weeks. The American group doesn't really consider de dehydration, however. Now, some factors that are not considered really by any groups are genetic conditions and mutations or family histories of these, as well as uh, there are several medications as, and uh, metabolic acidosis that actually increases uh, the amount of free bilirubin and thus uh, bilirubin getting into um, uh, the brain. It is important to note, however, that uh, in one study on the, uh, in the pilot chronicters registry, it did, did demonstrate that in 42% of those who went on to have chronicters, 42% did not have any risk factors that were identified. Now, according to this CPS, there's an estimated 60% um, of newborns will develop jaundice, and 2% of these will actually re reach severe levels. In studies of term and late preterm infants from a large California group study, the following incidences were by severity. Um, their data collection occurred between 1995 and 2000 uh, and included 526,000 in infants. They had a Incidence of severe hyperbilly at 2%, of critical hyperbilly at 0.14, and extreme hyperbilly at 0.01. The Canadian PDF surveillance program, however, did note uh, that over the last 10 years, uh, there's been a significant uh, fourfold reduction in the amount of um, uh, severe hyperbilirubinemia. The true incidence of acute encephalopathy is quite uncertain as uh, the definitions um, and monitoring kind of vary throughout the world. And all of this is really inferred from population data. However, the same Canadian Pediatric Surveillance Program uh, reported that of the 258 full-term infants born between 2002 and 2004 who did require exchange transfusion or had critical serum levels, 20% uh, of these had at least one abnormal neurologic sign at the time of presentation, and five had documented hearing loss or significant neurologic sequelae at the time of discharge. Now, assuming the full 20% of this had neuro signs that were in fact uh, acute encephalopathy, the incidence would be placed somewhere between one in 10,000 live births. Chronic encephalopathy, on the other hand, uh, has an incidence between 1.2 and 2.3 per 100,000 live births uh, per year. The prevalence of chronicterus um, is really rare in those uh, who have less than critical hyperbilirubinemia and gets as high as 25% in those who have levels over 500. The risk of cerebral palsy secondary to chronicterus uh, was reported at 0.57 per 100,000 births uh, for those who exceeded exchange transfusion thresholds. And in the US, uh, deaths associated with chronicterus between 1979 and 2006 occurred at a rate of 0.28 deaths per million live births. Now, causes of uh, hyperbilirubinemia are varied, and the underlying pathologies uh, uh, can be certain diseases or exaggerated uh, by mechanisms responsible for normal neonatal physiologic jaundice. Now, identification of these underlying pathologic causes of neonatal hyperbilirubinemia is useful in determining whether therapeutic in interventions are needed and the timing of, of those interventions to prevent severe hyperbilirubinemia. 
any increase in bilirubin load resulting in significant hypermobility is due to either an increase in production or a decrease in clearance or a combination of the two. Now, before beginning to discuss these etiologies, I do want to note that this, uh, these rounds are a brief overview of several of the important causes whose identification could add to or alter management, and by no means is an exhaustive uh, uh, discussion of anything in detail. Benign neonatal hyperbilirubinemia um, is a common occurrence uh, and is usually self-resolving without the need for intervention. However, it can be exacerbated by underlying pathologies. Now, this normal transitional phenomenon occurs in nearly all newborns and is caused by the accumulation of unconjugated bilirubin due to four factors. Firstly, newborns have more red blood cells uh, with a hematocrit between 50 and 60%, and there is increased turnover of these fetal red blood cells producing more bilirubin. The clearance, conjugation, and in turn excretion are decreased due to the deficiency of hepatic enzymes, which in term infants at seven days old is only approximately 1% of those present in adults. Now, enterohepatic re recirculation of bile is increased because of the amount of deconjugation that occurs in the intestines. And this is really due to uh, infants not having normal intestinal flora, which would help prevent this reabsorption. Term newborns uh, typically have elevated levels that peak around 137 to 154 micromoles in the Caucasian population, but do get as high as 171 to 239 micromoles uh, per liter in the East Asian population. Usually this peak occurs between 48 hours and 120 hours of life. And this entity really does demonstrate the importance that, of measuring serum concentrations, actually plotting it to, uh, on the curves and providing good follow-up for patients. Now, usually this jaundice will resolve within the one, first one to two weeks of life, typically by one week in formula-fed Caucasians uh, and by day 10 in Asian infants. In exclusively breastfed newborns, however, you, resolution can take uh, up to three to four weeks. Any persistence of hyperbilirubinemia beyond the two-week mark, though, um, has been labeled prolonged hyperbilly, and these infants usually require a better assessment, uh, specifically a conjugated bilirubin level. There are several pathologic causes of increased bile production, and most notably uh, isoimmune-mediated hemolysis, either by ABO or RH incompatibility, which is the most common cause of severe pathologic hyperbilly. Next up would be sepsis, and although the mechanism is unknown, it's suggested that increased oxidative stress uh, damage, damages that red blood cells causing lysis. Uh, if there is any sudden increase or onset of jaundice, uh, sepsis should be considered uh, quite early in the assessment. Other factors include inherited red, red blood cell membrane deficits like hereditary spherocytosis or erythrocyte enzymatic defects um, like glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. Other things like polycythemia or sequestering of blood in a closed space like a cephalohematoma, uh, or in large infants born to diabetic mothers, uh, mainly due to polycythemia and ineffective erythropoiesis. Problems of decreased clearance include several genetic disorders, including uh, Krigler, Nahar, and Gilbert's, as well as uh, various genetic factors, including random mutations in the conjugating enzyme UGT1A1 and polymorphism uh, within the chain that's uh, directly before it. Other causes of decreased clearance include maternal diabetes, congenital hypothyroidism, uh, galactosemia, and panhypopit, although the last two uh, conditions usually present with an elevated conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. And these disorders are usually identified in the metabolic screening program. However, at time of presentation, um, the screening results actually might not be available. Some causes of increased uh, recirculation of bilirubin include breast milk jaundice, the underlying mechanism is not really clear, and it's defined as the persistence of benign neonatal hyperbilly beyond the first two to three weeks of age. 
Usually it presents after the first three to five days of life and peaks within two weeks after birth. It then progressively declines to normal level levels over the next several weeks. Functionally or, or functional or anatomical obstruction, such as an ileus or intestinal obstruction, um, increases uh, recirculation due to decreased motility. This is usually seen as a larger uh, total bile level in the small bowel compared to large bowel obstructions. Example of this would be uh, 10 to 25 percent of infants with pyloric stenosis can present with jaundice when the vomiting begins. Other uh, causes are lactation failure, and this usually occurs within the first week of life, uh, leading to an inadequate intake of fluids and calories, which results in hypovolemia and weight loss. This decreased intake also causes a slower uh, bilirubin elimination as, uh, as well as an increased recirculation. Now to walk through some of the anatomy and physiology, uh, bilirubin is produced uh, by the hemolysis of, of red blood cells in 80 to 90 percent um, uh, of the total bilirubin production. The remaining 20, 10 to 20 percent is the um, breakdown of other heme-containing proteins such as cytochromes and catalase. Bilirubin clearance and excretion occurs within the following steps as depicted um, quite well in this diagram. Firstly, hepatic uptake occurs when the circulating bilirubin bound to albumin uh, gets to the liver. Bilirubin then dissociates from albumin and is taken up by hepatocytes for processing. Conjugation occurs um, by the U um, GT enzyme, and excretion usually occurs uh, when the conjugated bilirubin is secreted into bile and then excreted into the digestive tract. Recirculation occurs when the secreted conjugated bile is rebroken down by intestinal epithelial cells. Now, this is usually prevented in adults um, as uh, the bilirubins uh, reduced to urobilin by intestinal bacterial enzymes, but neonates' guts are essentially sterile at birth, so uh, infants uh, don't really have this protective feature. Now, the clinical presentation of hyperbilirubinemia uh, is usually due to bilirubin deposition, either in the skin, conjunctiva, or the brain. Jaundice, or the yellowing color produced by deposition in the skin and subcutaneous tissues, is depicted quite well in this infant, um, is not a reliable predictor or estimate of serum bile levels or the se severity of symptoms or its trajectory. Serum levels can actually be significant in the absence of clinical jaundice, jaundice especially if uh, it's a rapidly rising level. It can be quite hard to detect in, in patients of color, and jaundice usually progresses uh, in a cephalocaudal direction, appearing first in the face at total serum levels between 68 and 137 micromoles, and the entire body becomes involved when levels are over 257. Now, conjunctival or scleral icterus um, is involved in the deposition in conjunctiva and observed on the sclera. The evidence here is mixed on the correlation between uh, uh, it and uh, the comparison of hyperbilirubin levels. Although, if present, I would definitely check a serum level. And if, if absent, it's unlikely that uh, total serum levels are high enough to really to require intervention. Although I will say in the few infants that I've seen um, with neonatal jaundice, I have never been able to actually evaluate the eyes effectively. So this is actually something super difficult to do. Or maybe there's people just better at it than I am. The uh, acute encephalopathy or BIND, uh, which uh, can progress um, uh, from hyperbilirubin states, progresses through three phases. Um, this is a tool that was dedicated or developed by the American group that actually allows assessment and uh, categorization within the three phases um, of encephalopathy or BIND um, and is actually quite good at, at monitoring the infant throughout. Now in the early phases, clinical signs are quite subtle. Infant could be a bit sleepy but rousable and when aroused has a mild to moderate uh, hypotonia and a bit of a high-pitched cry. When you get into the intermediate phase, the infant can be febrile and lethargic with a poor suck or a bit irritable and jittery. 
the cry is often described as shrill and the infant is difficult to console. Now, mild to moderate hypertonia develops, usually beginning with the backward arching of both the neck and the trunk. When you get to the advanced phase, this is characterized by apnea, inability to feed, fever, seizures, and a semi-comatose state that can progress to coma. Hypertonicity presents as persistent retrocolis or epithotonos with a bicycling and twitching of the hands and feet. The cry, if, if present, is uh, inconsolable, but maybe also weak or absent. And death is usually a result of respiratory failure or intractable seizures. Other findings on physical exam that may be suggestive of underlying conditions associated with increased risk for hyperbilly include pallor, which could suggest anemia due to hemolysis, enclosed hemorrhage, like a cephalohematoma, extensive bruising, or hepatosplenum legly. The pathophysiology associated uh, with BIND, which is the combination of uh, acute encephalopathy and chronic changes, bilirubin is normally carried around bound to albumin, and in conjugated bilirubin um, that is not bound has the ability to enter the brain uh, and cause cell death by apoptosis or necrosis. The brain region most often affected include the basal ganglia and the brainstem nuclei for oculomotor and auditory functioning. Uh, this accounts for those clinical features observed in patients with BIND, including disorders of vision, hearing, gait, speech, cognition, and language, as uh, described by some of the, the chronic uh, changes associated uh, listed on the, the slide. Now, the screening and prevention recommendations outlined by the Canadian group uh, has the goal for pre-discharge screening to identify at-risk neonates and prevent mortality and morbidity uh, associated um, with severe hyperbilly. When neonates are screened, um, monitored, and treated appropriately and in a timely fashion, almost all neonates uh, with hyperbilly even those with risk factors have a benign outcome and avoid some of those long-term sequelae that I mentioned. A tool was developed to aid in this. Specifically, total billy can be plotted on the chart described on screen at an age-specific percentile-based um, nomogram, which was originally developed in a racially diverse population of newborn infants born in Philadelphia. This is referred to the Botani nomogram, and in this group of in infants, 60% of them were breastfeeding. The weight was appropriate for gestational age and direct Coombs test was negative. Um, this, uh, this group actually allowed for uh, the development of this nomogram to aid physicians to identify who is at risk and how neonates should be followed up and what poten potential trajectories could be. Now in this study, it demonstrated the predictability of this curve for subsequent significant hyperbilirubinemia in healthy term and near-term near newborns. This was originally published in 1999 and demonstrated that timed measurements um, of uh, hyperbilirubin um, at discharge between 18 hours of life and three days could actually predict total serum levels uh, greater than the 95th percentile, uh, which is the kind of the baseline where phototherapy begins to be important, such that infants with total serum levels at discharge less than the 40th percentile um, rarely ever uh, exceeded the 95th percentile. Those who fell between the 40th and 75th percentile had a 2% uh, chance of developing uh, severe hyperbilly above the 95th percentile. And those who were uh, initially measured with bilirubins greater than the 75th percentile had a 13% chance of um, reaching levels over the 95th percentile over the coming days. Now, previous guidelines uh, recommended individualized risk stratification and screening. However, the observational data from large cohort studies found that universal screening was far superior. 
although there has been no prospective control trials to evaluate the effectiveness of these universal screen programs, it is an opportunity to perform a screen using serum or transcutaneous levels before the period of highest risk and to use this to then determine the risk profile and individualized follow-up. The CPS recommends testing within 24 to 72 hours, plotting on the curve and then arranging follow-up as directed by this table. Many institutions perform this serum screen usually at the, the same time as uh, the metabolic screen at 24 hours of life using capillary sampling, which gives a very good estimate, estimate of uh, total serum levels. At the time of discharge, uh, follow-up is arranged, information and guidelines about jaundice are provided to parents, and instructions are given to the family of when to return and whom to contact with any medical issues. It's important to note, though, if family cannot uh, guarantee follow-up, um, the patient should not really be discharged. And this is really important, specifically uh, at that kind of tween time, but, um, like a Friday afternoon, where there's no possibility of them uh, seeing their family physician or any other healthcare provider for four, over 48 hours. And in this instance, um, we, they would recommend either not discharging or having them follow up with the emergency department. So you get one of these kiddos in the department. Um, investigations usually should start with a clinical per pertinent history of the baby and mother, family history, uh, description of labor and delivery as pointed out by our, our excellent juniors uh, when discussing the cases, as well as the infant's clinical course since discharge and other risk factors. Lab work that should be sent off and immediately should be a total billy, a DAT, and a, a, a group and screen. If the uh, total serum billy comes back significantly elevated and the infant could need admission for monitoring or treatment, a further workup then becomes quite reasonable to include a conjugated bilirubin level, a CBC uh, with diff for hemoglobin and hematocrit levels, a blood smear and a red cell um, a morphology examination, as well as a reticulocyte count. Now sepsis workup um, becomes important if other investigations are not clearly identifying a cause, but if the infant is well appearing, I would start with a partial septic workup um, and advance as appropriate. If the newborn screen has been done, um, that's great. If not, I would complete a, a total or um, a TSH level. And if uh, the, 90, if the uh, total serum lev level comes back over the 95th percentile, um, I would try to see if you can uh, evaluate what their initial level was to see if the rate of rise exceeds uh, 3.4 micromoles an hour, which points more towards hemolysis. It's also important to note that if any treatment is required, um, getting testing for any metabolic or genetic causes before treatment uh, occurs um, is relevant as after this, uh, some diagnoses become quite challenging. So if there's a positive screening test, let's say the infant was sent in because they were born at home or discharged prior to 24 hours, Plot uh, that level on the screening nomogram, and if above uh, the 75th percentile, I would look for other factors in their history, uh, send off the DHT if you haven't already done so, and plot on one of the treatment nomograms. If it's below intervention, uh, considerations for admission is based on the current concentration and the presence or absence of additional risk factors. Now the guidelines for therapy are based on limited direct evidence, but the CPS um, as well as the AAP that agrees that this is the most reasonable uh, standard um, for monitoring whether treatment is required. Another important thing to note is uh, to really try to ensure that the baby doesn't get hypothermic with all of the evaluations and lab work as that can actually make them much more sick. So back to our case. Um, what would you want to do with this child? You send off the lab work as follows and you get a total serum level back at 237.8. Let's go with Rob. 
uh, plot those uh, Billy uh, levels on the graph, depending on their age. Perfect. So you do that like this, kind of going uh, uh, based on their age and then appropriate, um, uh, appropriately going over to the uh, serum concentration. Now, this is kind of getting to the higher intermediate zone. So I would also plot this on the phototherapy chart. And you can see it's a borderline value. Uh, the DAT does come back negative, and as such, um, this term infant would be most um, uh, supported by the blue line there to see whether or not phototherapy is required. Now, what do you think is likely going on with this child? Let's go with Shane. Uh, so I, I can't remember in this case whether they're breastfed or what may be, but I mean, certainly uh, if the DAT is negative and we're in the low risk area, it could be any of the number like physiologic jaundice could be related to breastfeeding or breast milk, probably being the most common, but probably needs to just follow up. Yeah. So this case is likely a combination of physiologic jaundice coupled with lactation failure and dehydration. And if we look at what uh, the CPS would uh, recommend, um, you can see that uh, just routine care and follow-up um, is kind of the best practice. Now, the US criteria does offer a much more descriptive if this, then this type method, um, and they would actually uh, push for follow-up within 24 hours with a, another measurement. Um, but this case really depends on whether or not uh, they can get into a GP or a pediatrician um, and that those uh, physicians' ability to uh, test with reasonable turnaround. And if those are available, then sending them home uh, with follow-up with their uh, primary care provider is reasonable. If there's no follow-up, the midwife is signed off, uh, it's also very reasonable to bring these patients back to the emergency department for reassessment the next day. Back to our second case, this one's a little bit more cut and dry. The total serum level comes back at 378. And when you plot it on the graph is way above um, exchange transfusion levels, uh, such that it's essentially off the charts. So intensive phototherapy was then started for this infant, including a combination of overhead as well as um, light therapy with the pads. Now, phototherapy can be used to treat hyperbilly and prevent progression of hyperbilly, um, and is usually the initial intervention in all cases requiring treatment. The primary benefit of phototherapy is to prevent uh, total serum levels rising to a level at which exchange transfusion then would be recommended. And phototherapy might also decrease the risk of development of and chronic encephalopathic changes. Effective phototherapy results in a decline of total serum levels um, of at least 34 to 51 micrograms within the first four to six hours and a decrease in total levels as soon as two hours after initiation of treatment. Within 24 hours, you can see a fall up to 25 to 40% of those initial total serum levels. The two types um, of uh, phototherapy that are usually started in in the emergency department are either standard phototherapy, often called preventative or white light phototherapy as demonstrated in the picture on the left. The infant's exposed to a, a lower irradiance of between eight to 10 microwatts per centimeter squared per nanometer um, and involves a single bank of lights placed over an incubator with a diaper in place. Uh, this is fine for infants with moderately elevated levels um, at, or low risk factors, and, or if the concentration is kind of borderline but below the thresholds. Now, intensive phototherapy or multi phototherapy is used for infants who have rapidly rising levels if the, the total serum level is in the critical range or if they're awaiting exchange transfusion. The irradiance used here is three to four fold um, that of the single therapy by adding additional light sources, such as a pad under the infant to increase the body surface area exposed. This is demonstrated by the setup that we actually use in LHSC in the photo on the right. <laughs> 
Now, during delivery, it's important um, to ensure that the infants have uh, eye shields on, um, which are you, uh, some form of an opaque blindfold to prevent retinal injury, and to continue enteral nutrition as it's integral to to reduce uh, the addition of bilirubin um, due to enterohepatic recirculation. So I would continue with NG feeds or with breast feeds as the levels uh, decrease and the, and the infant is able to come out of the incubator and just use the light pad. Side effects of uh, this therapy mainly include dehydration, um, which is usually not really a concern if the baby's drinking well. Uh, others include temperature instability, um, hypermotility disorders, as well as a, um, a, a type of uh, syndrome called bronze baby syndrome, which is quite uncommon and is, it's completely reversible without any neurotoxicity associated, but it's um, a transient dark kind of grayish discoloration of the, the skin, serum, and urine, um, mainly seen in those who are uh, presenting with cholestatic jaundice who have been treated with phototherapy. It does remain uncertain whether there is any association or long-term sequelae of risks of seizures associated with phototherapy. Um, the possibility of uh, increased risk of cancer is there, but this is more so in older light sources or those that don't have all the uh, UV light removed. There has been some link to some skin lesions like cafe au lait spots or mel melanocytic nevi, as well as retinal injury. Um, the latter can be prevented with appropriate eye coverings, however. When you get to exchange transfusion, uh, this is an increasingly rare, uh, rarely used intervention, and in that it's typically reserved for in infants who are symptomatic, have severe hyperbilly with with rapidly increasing levels, um, or those who have not uh, responded to inf intensive phototherapy, or any sign um, of encephalopathy at our presentation. Now, infants who are close or meeting the criteria for exchange transfusion should be directly admitted or transferred to a, a hospital with a NICU present. And uh, while this transfer is being arranged, uh, intensive phototherapy um, should be continued. IV fluids should be given if the infant's dehydrated, and IVIG should be administered if there is any, any ISO immunization uh, risk um, due to uh, ABO or RH incompatibility. Now, just before exchange transfusion begins, a repeat serum level uh, should be checked. And what this does is to ensure that uh, the, the infant uh, has not responded to the phototherapy and still requires um, uh, exchange therapy, as uh, this is not a, um, a treatment without risks. The procedure is uh, uh, usually um, done with an umbilical line placement um, and can be uh, done as either double volume exchange or single volume exchange. You can have hair like, uh, it usually involves removing uh, aliquots of blood at a, a, essentially 10% or less of the infant's blood volume. So this is a UA, UA. this is a three by stop off. Right now, the off sign is over here, so there's no flow coming from the UA. So I'm going to turn this off uh, to a tear. This is a discarded end, so there's no blood flowing to the garbage or the waste bag. I'm going to get the blood out of the UA. It's coming from here, and I'm getting the blood into the 20cc syringe. So this should be 18 cc's over 5 minutes. I will be slow in getting the blood out of the UA. We are meanwhile infusing the blood through the UV, which is at a rate of 200 cc an hour. That video is actually available from the LHC uh, website. Um, it's about 10 minutes long and it walks you through the entire procedure of exchange transfusion if, God forbid, you ever had to put in a line and uh, set up the initial steps.
Exchange transfusion is also associated with several complications, and many of these actually are from the uh, transfusion of blood itself or the placement of the actual uh, UV, UVA uh, catheter. Uh, morbidity and mortality associated with exchange transfusion. Um, mortality has been estimated at 0.3% and uh, significant complications as listed on the screen has been as high as 1% in infants who have had to undergo exchange transfusion. So it's not a benign process. Now, other management considerations for these infants uh, include um, rehydration if visibly dehydrated. Um, and this usually uh, results in a prompt fall of total serum concentrations. Enteral feeding should also be continued um, as it will not only replace missing fluid, it will supply energy and reduce the enterohepatic reuptake of, of bilirubin. Then there's no evidence that IV fluid supplementation actually provides any better uh, any benefit beyond adequate oral hydration, unless the infant can't tolerate it. Um, and then enteral nutrition should be performed uh, with either human milk uh, expressed from the mom or um, pasteurized donor milk. And if neither of these are available, then to top up um, with formula. Specifically, management of uh, hemolytic disease includes the administration of IVIG as it acts as a competitor, competitive inhibitor uh, for the antibodies um, that are uh, causing the hemolysis. The dose is 0.5 to 1 kilogram over two hours and can be repeated if necessary. Back to the case. Um, the mom uh, actually uh, describes that maybe the baby was having trouble latching and that there might be some cracking to her nipples. So in this situation, you elected to bring that child back to the emergency department. You did counsel around breastfeeding tips and tricks, including a nipple shield uh, and potential for a lactation consult consultation. And you explained any signs that specifically neurologic symptoms that you would be concerned about for returning earlier. You did bring them back the next day and that the level has remained unchanged. It's not rising. Um, however, when you plot it on the chart, it's now falling through categories. So this becomes quite less concerning. And at this point in time, there's real no need for follow up. Um, you can have them follow up with just their uh, family doctor or pediatrician, but I wouldn't bring them back at this point. In the second case, uh, the one who has much more severe uh, hyperbilly um, was actually consulted to the NICU. They were put on antibiotics just due to the concern of sepsis and placed on quadruple phototherapy. They did receive IVIG and were able to continue uh, breastfeeding, uh, or sorry, feeding with breast milk um, through an NG tube. This baby actually received 100 hours of intensive phototherapy and was able to forego exchange transfusion and was discharged on day seven of life without any um, concerning neurologic uh, symptoms. Overall, the disposition of these infants, um, if they require exchange transfusion, they should go to the NICU or the PCCU if the NICU is full. Those requiring phototherapy often end up on the wards and PCTU. If there's any concern or the patient's not gonna have good follow-up, I would bring, be bringing those patients back to the emergency department the following day. And if those um, have no risk factors and are well below cutoff values, these patients can be uh, discharged home with follow-up um, on a kind of normal routine basis. When it comes to uh, infants who have hyperbilirubin that have been treated and, and appropriately identified, outcome is actually quite excellent uh, with minimal um, or no adverse uh, neurodevelopmental sequelae. Um, such that in a two-year follow-up study of the, some having a critical and extreme hyperbilly, um, formal cognitive testing was performed and there was no difference between patients with severe hyperbilly and the matched controls uh, based on cognitive testing. 
However, in a subset analysis of those with critical hyperbilly uh, that had a positive DAT, uh, lower IQ scores and some cognitive testing demonstrated uh, that those with uh, hyperbilly um, due to hemolysis uh, could have um, some uh, neuro or, um, cognitive um, long-term effects. However, there was no actual like uh, neuroscience or symptoms other than cognition. Now, those with kernictus is a different story, um, as well as those who have chronic outcomes. Uh, these patients are, are usually um, uh, quite involved patients for the remaining remainder of their lives. So the main take home points for today is that most infants do quite well. Uh, bilirubin measurements need to be performed, um, especially when patients develop jaundice within the first 24 hours of life. Anyone older than 24 hours where jaundice is excessive for the age, such that it's extending down the trunk. Uh, those who have failure of resolution after seven days um, in uh, uh, formula-fed infants or 21 days in breastfed infants, and those who are still jaundice after two weeks. Sepsis, uh, and in particular urinary tract in infections, should be considered in infants with new onset jaundice who don't have a, a significantly obvious cause. I would definitely be inquiring about risk factors as it really does change your suspicion, concerns, and management of these patients. And definitely consider what the patient's access to follow-up is and how reliable um, that follow-up can be. And if there's any concerning features, um, admission for uh, monitoring is, is a reasonable option. Thanks for listening, guys. And if you have any questions, I'll uh, answer them now. Hey, Teresa, I just, uh, it's Rod speaking. I just want to thank you for a very excellent rounds and a good overview of jaundice. Um, I, I think a, a really important takeaway point too is that if you if you know a patient is in uh, a concerning range, that time to to phototherapy is a very important um, uh, um, um, uh, thought process. Uh, you don't want to be related to a delay in phototherapy. Uh, it's kind of like anaphylaxis; you don't know which patients are going to go back down fast, and the ones that end up developing horrible cornicterus uh, and neurologic effects. Sometimes you don't know until it's 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 clear that they're heading that direction. And you mm -hmm. hope that you had interviewed earlier. That's a fair point. Thanks, Rod. Hey, Patrice, it's Danielle. Hey, um, no. Just a quick question for you. you. You alluded to a bunch of different guidelines, uh, like the Canadian, the like American guidelines. Would you say, like, if someone was looking to read one or sort of use one as a rule of thumb, obviously not necessarily in our PEDS Emerge, but working on think more peripherally, do you have one that you'd recommend, or maybe the PEDS guys could weigh in on that? To be honest, I actually preferred the UK guidelines. Um, I actually found them quite algorithmic. And for those who aren't going to do in-depth reading or um, consideration of these infants, uh, those guidelines actually provide a very good uh, description um, as to what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. So those would be what I would recommend. And just keep in mind that uh, uh, Canadian values have a little bit different levels um, for uh, intervention cutoffs um, and kind of using the Canadian charts, but uh, with the, the UK algorithms. Awesome, thanks. Uh, Patrice, a quick question. Um, you had mentioned, uh, uh, with regards to total uh, serum billy and then the uh, conjugated versus like direct and indirect. Uh, yep. What again was that cutoff for when it becomes like direct versus indirect? And then uh, just a second question maybe for the um, for the peds people, uh, if they have like an app that they recommend that they use uh, to check levels or anything like that. Yeah. So um, to answer your first question, um, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia uh, should be considered in infants um, whose uh, uncon or whose conjugated level is greater than 17 micromoles per liter, or if both the total and conjugated levels are up, um, that the conjugated level is greater than 20% of the total serum level. Um, it should also be considered in infants who have uh, jaundice persisting past two weeks. 
Now, a good app or calculator that you can use um, actually is embedded in um, up to date. They actually have a calculator that you put in the infant's age and uh, drop downs for some risk factors, as well as putting in the total serum level, and it spits out exactly what to do. Those use the American guidelines, which is the same intervention curves used in Canada. Hey, it's Daryl. Um, another website you can use um, is based on American as well, but billytool.org. And you just punch in the um, time that they were born, the time that you drew the Billy Rubin, and you can do it in SI or IU units, like American or Canadian units. And it tells you um, the risk factors, um, what number you're looking for for each um, risk level, and then also gives you follow up based on what um, what risk level they're at based on their bilirubin at that time and, and how often and when to follow up. That's great, thanks Daryl. Patrice, uh, it's Dawn. I might've missed this early in the presentation, but has the incidence of neonatal jaundice been uh, changing? Has it changed over the past couple of decades in Canada or Ontario? So the baseline incidence um, from all told causes has not, um, but the incidence of severe or critical hyperbilly levels has. In, uh, in Canada, um, from a period of about uh, uh, 2002 to 2013, it, it saw a fourfold decrease in those who had severe levels of hyperbilly. So we are doing a good job with uh, screening and preventative techniques. All right, well, if there's no other questions, I thank you for tuning in. Um, and if there's anything else you'd like to know, please uh, get a hold of me offline as there is uh, a lot more information that could have been said, but I didn't want to bore you to tears. <laughs>